confirmation yet. There, there it is, live on YouTube. Oh, yep. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. I haven't finished yet, but it's making progress. Yep. You may hear that strange double sound and echo in just a second that I'll try to kill quickly. <clears throat> As usual, Dave, I'll, uh, I'll uh, shut off my video there to uh, conserve my bandwidth. Sure. Yep. Not a problem. Okay. We're completely live on YouTube and posted on Facebook. Perfect. Okay. So your slides there, Chris, are not quite there. There, there we go. Let's get. Okay. And it's 727. I've done everything, so I'm safe to go to this mode. And we're completely ready to go uh, when we hit 7.30. Sounds good. Okay, we'll just wait till then. I've got two minutes to go. Unless I look at the analog clock on my wall, which is running two minutes faster and driving me crazy. But anyways, I have to take it down from the wall and adjust it. And you know, Dave, I frequently have issues losing the cursor on my screen. Yeah. Got it on one of my two screens, but not on the one that I need for to uh, to stop practice session. So typically you've been doing that button. Right? Oh, okay. Yep, I can do that. I can so see the button, but I can't get my mouse over to hover over it. Okay, so I, I can start the webinar then when it's time. Yep. Want to something weird? Okay, Stephen, hello. Good after or evening, I guess it is now. Uh, yeah, it is evening, so I, I just want to make sure your audio is good, so we're, we're good on that. All right. Yep. So, uh, Stephen, you're right after my Ottawa skies in the uh, order of things. So, just so you know where you're, you're coming in there. Okay, so folks, I'm going to... Early. Yeah. So, I'm going to uh, go live here. So, here we go. Okay, so the numbers are starting to climb. So welcome, folks who've just joined us. We're just going to give everybody an opportunity to come in. There we go. Okay, folks, we're just waiting for everybody to uh, log in here. Then we'll get things underway. Just give it another minute or so. And uh, let me just go back up here. Here we go. Okay, so it looks like our numbers have uh, stabilized, so we'll get things underway. Oh, the recording just stopped. So hang on a second here. Oh, Chris has dropped out. So something has happened here. Okay, folks, hang on. We just got a couple of little technical uh, difficulties here. Um, Chris, who is running the slides for us, has... Uh, dropped out into the ether. So we're just going to pause for a moment here and get things underway. So uh, sorry about that. I'll just give an opportunity to uh, come back on. Okay, in the meantime, what I'm going to do here, just in case I need to share the slides, give me a second here. Okay, Chris, you're back on. 
Uh, I have no idea what happened. Have you continued on with the meeting or are you stuck with it? No, we're, we're stuck because we don't have any slides. So bear with me. There we go. Okay, folks, I think we're back up and running. I can see the slides just fine. So welcome to our July meeting and special welcome to folks from the other RASC centers. We have two uh, guest speakers tonight from the Montreal RASC center. So welcome folks. So move on to the next slide. Just a couple of security things on Zoom. Um, we will not be monitoring the chat box during the meeting. Uh, please use the Q&A box for any questions to the speakers. And when I get the Q&A, I will pass them on to the speaker at an appropriate time. Uh, do not raise your hand. Uh, just use Q&A, please. For your security, do not click on any web links that might appear in the chat or Q&A windows. Okay, moving on. So here is tonight's program. So we have the Ottawa Skies for July. Our president, Stephen Norris, has an announcement for us. I welcome Pierre Paquette from the Montreal RASC, talking about the ancient astronomical instruments and Babylonian astronomy. Now, following that, we'll have a five-minute break, and then we have David Schumann from the RASC in Montreal talking about space shuttles and rockets. We have a number of observations this evening. There was that little solar eclipse event last month, generated lots of pictures. And then we'll have some uh, wrap-up announcements. I'm hoping that we will be done by about 9.30, 9.45 this evening. I'll try to keep things moving. Okay, moving on. So we welcome the uh, new members from May and June. Uh, we've been having some database challenges, and that's why we've had to sort of combine the two together. So welcome all those who have joined us, uh, new members in May and June. And since the start of 2021, we've had 36 new members. So welcome, everybody. Members in the news. Chris Terran was on the uh, morning startup show talking about the solar eclipse. Maybe he was talk about, talking about dog herding sheep. I don't think so. Uh, probably the solar eclipse. So uh, congratulations, Chris, for being on the uh, morning show on 88.5. And congratulations to Dave Anderson of the Ottawa Centre who has uh, met the requirements for the Explore the Universe certificate. Congratulations. Okay, so let's take a look at the uh, the Ottawa skies for July. So first of all, we have the moon phases. We're moving into a new moon uh, tomorrow and uh, full moon on July the uh, 24th. The uh, full moon was known by our indigenous peoples as the buck moon because the male buck deer would begin to grow their new antlers at this time of year. This new moon has also been known as the thunder moon and the hay moon. We have uh, one comet up there at least, Comet 15P Finley, and here's where it is in the sky. It's pretty small, so um, you're going to need a, tele a fairly strong telescope to see it. Uh, this is a, It comes back every 6.4 years, so if you miss it uh, this year, uh, we'll come back in uh, six and a half years from now. We have the Delta Acarids meteor shower. And uh, it's, there, it's just following the uh, full moon on the 24th. So unfortunately, this one's probably going to be mostly washed out, about uh, 20 meteors per hour. It's not a super, uh, super big meteor shower. Uh, we've got the Perseids coming up next month. Sun, days are getting uh, shorter. A good thing for us in, in astronomy. It's always good to not have to stay up quite so late to wait for the darkness. And uh, next slide. This is an aha, you missed it. I did actually put this in my presentation uh, last month because it did happen on July 4th. We had the Mercury, the greatest Western elongation. And uh, I think we actually have some pictures of Mercury in some of our observations today. Venus visible in the evening, but it's it's setting uh, just after the sun sets. It's uh, 
the skies are still pretty bright when the Venus is setting, as is Mars. So uh, I think we're going to sort of lose those two for the next little while as they uh, disappear with the sun. Jupiter, uh, right now around midnight, uh, you'll be able to see Jupiter up in the sky. By the end of the month, uh, you will only have to stay up until 10 o'clock to uh, see Jupiter at a reasonable distance above the horizon. Saturn, uh, even earlier, so uh, around 11 o'clock uh, right now, and by the end of the month, uh, around uh, 9 o'clock, you'll be able to see uh, Saturn up in the sky. Uranus is visible before sunrise, and as is uh, Neptune. And there is our cartoon of the month. Okay. So, uh, oh yes, we got, I forgot about these slides here. Um, so I'm still doing the virtual uh, inter interactive introduction to astronomy. And I've done some a couple of bookings over the summer. I'm actually doing uh, this presentation, both of these types of presentations at the Ottawa Public Library. I did two this week. And uh, I'm doing the next slide. You can go to the next slide, Chris. Uh, Astronomy, the next presentation is a week today at 2.30 in the afternoon. If you wish to see this one, go to the Ottawa Public Library website and uh, search for astronomy. I also sent direct Zoom links out to everybody who's on the RASC distribution list along with handouts in case you don't have an Ottawa library card. So uh, it's been pretty well received. I have about 25 kids come out to each of my sessions. Stephen, I'm going to turn it over to you. Let me just highlight you first though so everybody can see you. There we go. Okay, hello everyone. I'll try and not take up too much of your time. Uh, last thing you want is some boring center stuff uh, going on here. Um, however, it's encouraging that now that we're halfway through 2021, uh, things do appear to be opening up a bit. Um, obviously vaccinations are coming along and hopefully the, uh, the Delta variant doesn't deal us too big a blow so we're actually having a council meeting next week. It's a regularly July one. And we're very pleased to be able to start discussing how we're gonna open things back up again, perhaps get into uh, some more public events. Uh, obviously that's not tomorrow, but we would do wanna have that path laid out for us. If anyone has any real strong views on this or our ideas on how we can do it uh, uh, safely or in a hybrid fashion, uh, please let uh, any of us know on council uh, so that we can take your thoughts into consideration. I'd also like to take this moment to give a big shout out uh, to everyone who was involved in Virtual Astronomy Day last May 15th. I'm not even gonna try and name everyone because I know I'd forget someone but it really was great. I mean, this was a joint affair with the Ottawa Valley Astronomy and Observers Group, and it really highlights what we can do uh, under these um, rather trying circumstances. So uh, kudos to everybody involved in that. Now, speaking of involvement, um, there's a couple of things that the center would like to perhaps get some more involvement with. Uh, the first being uh, David Parfait, who has been wonderfully serving as our treasurer for the last few years, has unfortunately for us accepted a position in Winnipeg. Now, he's generously offered to, to keep going on a virtual basis and, and assist in everything until we can find someone. But we really are now actively looking for someone to take on the role as treasurer. Uh, it's not as onerous as it used to be. Uh, we are electronic. Um, the books aren't that difficult for the center, which is uh, thankfully uh, a good thing. And they're up to date, which some treasurers did not have the benefit of getting when they came on to the position. So things are in good shape. If you've got any sort of knowledge of accounting, we'd love to hear from you. It's, like I say, it's not that onerous. 
and I'm pretty sure you'd find it rewarding. The other thing we're looking for is anyone or group of people that might be interested in videography. Uh, we were approached earlier in the year by the Ottawa Public Library to assist them with their telescope loan program and do some familiarization videos of their specific equipment and also push the RASC, which is always a good thing as well. Paul Sadler started this project on behalf of the center, but unfortunately COVID-19 restrictions and for Paul life got in the road and he wasn't able to complete it. He's got a huge amount of it done in terms of the prep work. We just need someone to do some actual video, video work and a bit of editing. So uh, it's a, any interest in this area, um, please let, uh, let me know. And uh, it's a great opportunity to help out new astronomers and at the same time promote the center. Uh, and finally, uh, this isn't, uh, you'll be hearing more of this from uh, Rick Scholes, our FLO director, but we're just about to start on some really good projects out at FLO now that the restrictions are waning uh, with the Rolf Meyer Dome, getting that uh, up and running uh, and some real uh, good improvements. So if you're looking to finally get outside and do some stuff, um, probably starting in August, uh, we've got some real areas out there that you could give a hand. It really is true that you get more out of your membership when you participate. Um, I urge you to think about these things and uh, get a hold of us if you, uh, if you really uh, think you can help. Anyway, that's enough for me. Let's get back to the meeting. Okay, thank you very much, Stephen. So um, just uh, for those of you who are new to the RESC, uh, the FLO is, is the Fred Lawson Observatory and it's out near the mill of Contail. And uh, just a second here, there we go. Uh, it was out, out near the uh, mill of Contail and uh, your new members are most welcome to uh, participate out there. So I'm pleased to have Pierre Paquette uh, come and talk to us about ancient astronomical instruments and Babylonian astronomy. So I'm going to get uh, Chris to uh, stop sharing his screen and let me just uh, see if I can find him on the screen here. There he is. I'm here, I'm here. There you go. Now you're spotlighted, Pierre. So go ahead and share your desktop and we're good to go. Let's see if we can do this. Can you see it? Yes. Awesome. So I'm going to try and be quick. Uh, I was, uh, I don't know, I misunderstood. I thought I had a little more than half an hour. So uh, let's do that really quick. Uh, let's talk about Babylonian astronomy because, um, well, uh, someone once said that uh, history began in Sumer and astronomy began in Sumer. So in uh, Sumer was a... Um, uh, part of what is called Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia is between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers in uh, what is now Iraq. Uh, the Sumerians invented writing, which is using um, cuneiform, like we can see at the bottom of the screen there. Uh, by the way, this means uh, planet. We're going to see it a, a little later. And uh, the uh, there were other groups living in that area, such as the Akkadians and some of the Akkadians had a dialect called Babylonian, and there was another dialect called Assyrian. So we're going to uh, be interested more about Babylonian astronomy uh, tonight. So in the beginning, they had two kinds of calendar, the lunar and administrative calendars. Uh, the lunar was really that you could see the first crescent of the moon to begin the month. It's still the ancestor of the Muslim calendar to, nowadays. And um, the administrative calendar was fixed at 30 days. That was much easier to calculate instead of the moon that sometimes it's 28, some, uh, sorry, sometimes it's 29, sometimes it's 30 days. So, and what do you do if uh, it's cloudy, you don't see the moon. So to be sure they had 30 days because it, uh, the lunar month was never more than 30 days. 
And for them, the, planet, the planets were deities, and they thought that maybe the behavior of the planets could affect earthly matters. I put the invert uh, a question mark there. It's called an um, irony point. It means that um, the sentence before is kind of ironic because we know nowadays that the movements of celestial objects really has nothing to do with what happens on the Earth, except maybe for astronomers to organize their events. So the calendar was divided in 12 months and at, they had a 19 year intercalation cycle. That's because uh, 12 lunar months are a little shorter than a full year and 13 are a little sh longer. So what they would do is every first, third, sixth, ninth, 11th, 14th and 17th year, they would add a month to the calendar to keep it in, in, uh, in phase with, the, um, with reality. Um, and um, some of our constellations actually come from the Babylonians and they had puns, they had uh, word games and sometimes there were mistranslations. So for example, they had a constellation that was called Iku, the field. Um, so in a field, uh, a field is squarish and they had a given length and width for the, uh, the field, which was the same. So. Uh, a big square in the sky. Can anybody think of something? Yeah, well, Pegasus nowadays is the shape of a square. So the field was there, Pegasus, and it actually comes from there. So in Mycenaean, uh, ancient, really ancient Greek, Eco, which sounds a lot like Eco uh, in uh, Babylonian, meant horse. And the drawings they had in, um, in cuneiform in Babylonian could be read a different way. So the first one here was Ash, but it could also be read Dal, and Dal means to fly. And Iku can also be written in two uh, symbols here instead of just one that we see uh, after the little triangle here. And Ku means to cut. So if you cut a horse that flies, and uh, Ku also meant uh, Dur, and Dur meant the belly, if you cut a horse that flies at the belly, what do you get? Well, you get Pegasus. And uh, the name itself, Pegasus, comes from uh, another wordplay with the uh, Babylonians. And in that Igu or Iki meant spring. And in the ancient Greek, spring was Pegaso. So the name of the horse Pegasus comes from ancient Greek spring because of word games and mistranslations from Babylonian. Uh, my main interest in Babylonian astronomy is mathematical astronomy. How can you calculate stuff? And Babylonians really were good at calculating. Actually, writing was invented for administrative purposes. They would lend something to someone. They would have a, a little marking that meant their name and uh, little markings that meant how many of the things they lent. And eventually this became writing. So the Babylonians have two kinds of texts for, the, uh, for mathematical astronomy. They have procedure texts which explain how to do things and the ephemeris, a little bit like we have nowadays tables with the position of the sun, moon, planet, and so on. So they had seven planets, uh, which were the bibu, the word that we had in, uh, on the first slide, which means wild sheep, because the planet were basically moving what they thought was uh, randomly. Eventually they figured out it was not so random. So they behave like wild sheep. And the planets were the Sun, the Moon, and the five classical planets, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Each of them had also a deity associated with them. So the names here sometimes are, uh, instead of finding those words, we find the name of the gods or goddesses associated with uh, those uh, planets. And for example, the uh, some words also meant something else. For example, Hahu meant the moon, but it also meant month. A little bit like nowadays in English, month and moon are very similar. They come from the same root. And in other languages, it's the same word, the exact same word. For example, in Romanian, it's Luna. In Korean, it's Dal. 
In Turkish, it's I, and in Isikosa, it's Inyanga. Um, for the interior planets, Mercury and Venus, so of course, the Babylonians did not know that they were interior, as in orbiting between the Earth and the Sun. But for those planets that behave differently in the sky because they were always near the Sun, the Babylonians had six points that they were very interested in. So they would not compute the position of the planet for every day in between each of those, but they would compute the next occurrence of one of those points. For example, uh, they would calculate the, first, the, the next occurrence of the first visibility in the west after sunset. And uh, the Greek letters here that we see on the left are given by modern um, asteroid historians who started analyzing the uh, old text that we found. And for Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, there's five points, and one of them is diachronical rising, which is in the east just before sunset. It's just before true opposition. So they had no concept of opposition. They did not notice that the planet was exactly 180 degrees from the sun, but they still had some interest around that same time. And they wanted to calculate that. So one of the texts that explains how is this one here, which is cuneiform tablet ACT 810, ACT for Astronomical Cuneiform Texts. It's a collection that was done by um, Otto Nogebauer in the 1960s and 70s. So each of these little drawings means a word or a syllable or a concept and they have been decrypted. Um, I know it looks very complicated, but some knowledge is easy to get uh, about the numbers. So for example, numbers are just sets of strokes. And um, the text means from Cancer 9 to 9 Scorpius, so from the ninth degree of Cancer to the ninth degree of Scorpius, you add 30 degrees. So what you do is when Jupiter was in that part of the sky, for the next opposition or next uh, first uh, visibility and so on, you would just add 30 degrees. So there were uh, three sectors in the sky along the ecliptic, uh, and each, in each sector, the planet would move at a different uh, rate. And that was system A with three zones, and there was also system B, uh, which was uh, with a regular increase of the speed of the planet in the zones, so there were not three zones, but really from A to B, and it started going faster and faster until it reached point B, and then go slower and slower until it reached point A. For the moon, they had six lunar intervals. So for example, they had cool, which is the time between the moonrise and the sunset, uh, sorry, the sunrise, just before. And they had now, which was between the sunset and the first visible moonrise after sunset, and so on. So each of those intervals, they would time them with what we call uh, nowadays a water clock. So they had uh, basically a bowl of water. There was water leaking out, and they would put a certain amount of water in the container. And by the time it was empty, there was so much time elapsed, and they could measure with the uh, the bowl, they eventually may put gradations in the bowl to know how long was elapsed with uh, every uh, visibility. And the prediction of the first visibility of the first crescent was very important because for them it was the beginning of a new month. Even nowadays, um, for Muslim people, the observation of the first crescent is the beginning of the month. Uh, Jewish people use uh, the Hebrew calendar, which is slightly different in that they calculate when the next moon should be visible, and they go from there. So the Hebrew calendar is calculated, but still based on the moon. Uh, Babylonians were very precise in that uh, the text that they had, uh, I used the uh, translations available and I entered them in computer code and I continued the calculation up to the year 2041 and I compared the results to a real uh, modern uh, planetary theory and the average difference was only 4.4 degrees. That's basically nothing. And with system B, it was even better at uh, 0.6 degrees of uh, precision. 
the worst errors bring like five degrees for system B and 10 degrees for system A. So for a mathematical model that was about 2,500 years old, it's very surprising. Uh, so I only skimmed the surface and there are many books that you can read. Uh, this is a, a selection of those that I do possess. Um, there are many more, so that's not the only, um, those are not the only uh, books that you can read, but I found they're very useful. The first one, The History and Practice of Ancient Astronomy, covers basically up to the fall of the Roman Empire at, in around 500 uh, common era. And um, so, yeah, that's going to be the next part. It's the um, ancient astronomical instruments. So um, I'm looking for my PowerPoint here. I do not see my PowerPoint. Mm, oh, maybe here. So, yes. Do you see my PowerPoint? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, good. Let's go back to the first one. And um, let's hide that bar and leave this slideshow. Okay, so um, Babylonians did not have instruments per se, or at least not as far as we know. And uh, for some reason, um, the, um, the text that we have don't mention any instrument. We can figure that they had the, uh, what is called the gnomon, which is basically a stick planted in the ground. And uh, that was essentially the most ancient astronomical instrument. Um, it started, the earliest one we found dated back before um, uh, writing existed. So let's say about 7,000 years ago. And from there, the solar uh, clock or sundial sl slowly evolved. Here we see a marquette, it's a, an Egyptian thing. So you would basically um, hold it with your hand and let the plumb bob here go down and um, to, to make sure that it's uh, very vertical or that the bar here is actually horizontal. And you will point the bar towards the west in the morning and towards the east in the afternoon. And by the position of the shadow of the top here on the stick, you would know uh, when uh, what time it was from uh, the position of the shadow. So it was very convenient. It was not as cumbersome as this huge obelisk that there was one in the center of the village. Yeah, but if, what if you lived a little further, you could not see it. So that was uh, one way to uh, for everyone to uh, see that the um, that the um, that what time it was. So everyone could uh, uh, could uh, carry their own machet. And uh, for example, if uh, David tells me, "Oh, uh, let's meet uh, at uh, five after when the uh, when the shadow is uh, at the snake on the." Um, on the uh, the snake drawing on the top of the machet. So I would hold my machet and see when the shadow uh, happens to be there. And then I would know that it was time to go meet Dave. The sundial evolved and became uh, a beautiful instrument that we now have in uh, our gardens. And yes, I know that this one has two sixes um, instead of six and seven. And one, that really fascinated me it was uh, this one that uh, can be found at the uh, um, Aremetsi Museum, the uh, arts and uh, crafts or uh, arts and uh, work museums in uh, Paris, France. Um, this was set in a garden, so outside, of course, because it's a sundial, it doesn't work inside. And the uh, magnifying glass here would focus the light of the sun into the little cannon here and what would happen at exactly noon well boom you could hear that and that was the way that people knew that it was well time to go eat or something like this, whatever they did at lunchtime um <laughs> just for fun i saw one of those on uh, pawn stars just a few days ago uh, but the guy was very uh, disappointed because his 
was installed backwards, so it was uh, not an original, it was a copy. And this is a uh, another sundial which is on the vertical wall at the um, uh, um, Chateau de Tuyi in French, Chateau de Tuyi, sorry, which is now the Middle Ages Museum. And from that tower, uh, a famous astronomer named Charles Massier uh, observed many um, deep sky objects in the 1700s. Eventually, you want to measure angles. So the easiest way they found was the quadrant, which is basically just a quarter of a circle, hence the name quadrant, which you uh, uh, inscribe with graduations. And with a plumb bob, you measure uh, the angle of what you're pointing at with the uh, pointing veins on top here. Eventually, the uh, quadrant became more complicated. You could add hour lines and with the hour line depending on the position of the plumb bob and a little bead on the plumb bob you could know exactly what time it was uh, and much more other information uh, this one was made in the 1300s you can see here at the bottom the numbers are very different from today um, for example this kind of what looks like a four at the bottom left is actually a five so 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 80? No, that's a 4. The 4 was, would look like a, those little uh, loops that we hold, uh, uh, fabric loops that we have for causes like uh, AIDS, uh, cancer, and whatnot. And uh, 80, no, 40, 45, 50, again, like I said, the 5 would look like 4. 60, 70, the 7 would look like a triangle and 80 and 90 degrees. This one uh, deserves uh, mention because uh, as you can see, it was made in 1396. We see the, the date on top here. And it ended up in a large um, case that was uh, that would belong to a man in England. And eventually that man passed away in the mid 1900s, uh, maybe 60s and 70s. And uh, his grandson ended up with the case uh, in Australia, actually. <laughs> and uh, he went through the case and did not know what was in it. And eventually he realized that uh, this was a, uh, uh, looked ancient. It was all vertigreased and uh, dirty and uh, had suffered uh, a lot of uh, the uh, passage of time. And when he cleaned it, he realized Oh, 1396. Is it real? Is it unreal? Is it a forgery? Is it a copy or something? And eventually they realized that it was made for Richard Lionheart, and the little drawing here in 1396, uh, the, uh, Richard Lionheart, the uh, British uh, king. Another old instrument, not as old though, is the sextant, which is one sixth of a circle, hence the name sextant. And with a set of mirrors, you can uh, actually measure angles up to 120 degrees. So double that because each um, degree here would be split into by the mirrors. So uh, that would be a way to uh, increase uh, sensitivity. And with the vernier here, the uh, micrometric screw, you could measure angles down to a minute of arc. What do you do when it's night? There's no sun, so there's the Nocturne Lab. This is a uh, simple version uh, that we can see here, and there's a hole in the middle, and you held the uh, Nocturne Lab in such a way that you could see the pole star through it, and by adjusting the bar with the position of the Big Dipper or other set of stars, there were a few uh, possibilities, and the date, well, you could know exactly what time it was. This is a Jacob staff, so um, you would hit, hold that to your eye and, excuse me, each bar would be so many degrees and they could uh, be adjusted along the bar, so they would actually measure large angles with that. A beautiful instrument that I found was this uh, Triketrum, which was made in the uh, 14, 1500, and it could actually give the um, a set of positions in uh, different um, systems. So for example, you could have the uh, left, right, up, down. So the azimuth and altitude, you could have 
right ascension and declination, and you could also have ecliptic longitude and latitude. Uh, the one on the left, by the way, is a uh, reproduction made in the uh, early 2000s in the US. Um, this is the uh, simple uh, model. It's called an equatorium. It would basically be a physical implementation of uh, uh, Ptolemy's model of the, the sky, of the solar system, in that the planets would move on a small circle, the epicycle, which would move along a large circle that's the uh, different around the Earth. So basically, you would uh, check a table of uh, values and you would adjust the thing uh, depending on the values given in the tables and you would be able to find the position of the planet um, for any date uh, between or uh, outside of the, the, the dates given in the table. So one example that's slightly more uh, elaborate is this one here, which was done by uh, Peter Apianus in the uh, 1540. So Apianus calculated by hand, back, the, back then they had no calculators, they calculated the position of each planet for the beginning of each century between 7000 BCE and 7000 CE. So yeah, a very long time. And for each one, so I, uh, we can see on the right here, uh, you have the number of a century, a, a sign of the, um, the constellation and the position in the constellation. So there are two columns. Uh, well, there are two main columns. So the left for uh, BCE and the right for uh, CE or vice versa anyway. And um, so you would read the value in the first column and plot it on the outside rim. And the second column was used for the middle here. And then you would adjust for each year. So you would, uh, there's a little graduation somewhere. I cannot hear. For each one of those little squares, it's a day. And you can see around here, you have numbers. So uh, for example, the zero is here and one is around here and two is here and three and so on. So you would adjust that. And with that, um, you would get the position of the planet for any date between uh, those uh, given here. So for example, for 2021, I would read the 2000 line so Gemini 453, I adjust here Gemini 453, and I adjust the other name, the uh, the other uh, circles. There are se uh, five, uh, six different um, disks that can rotate in uh, the book. And um, one of the circles is adjusted then to uh, here, which is uh, Capricorn 2612. So adjust this one here. And with the little piece of string here and another piece of string that's missing here, you could calculate the position of the planet. Uh, in the uh, 1950s, there was an article in the Journal of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Sorry, a little loud cardinal on my uh, balcony. Um, so uh, there was an article in, uh, I think, 58 uh, about that instrument. And um, the, uh, the author had used it to calculate the position of Jupiter and found a big error of two degrees. And I used it. I uh, made my own uh, photocopy of uh, the uh, PDF that we, we could find online. And uh, so I made many copies, of course, and uh, used the uh, piece of string and needle and uh, some uh, brain grease to figure out how it worked. And sure enough, uh, yeah, I can calculate the position of the planets for any date with a precision of about one or two degrees, which is wonderful considering that this was Ptolemy's system, uh, which is wrong. And that was done like 500 years ago, rounded off. So really, really uh, wonderful. And the um, most known um, ancient astronomical instrument is this one here, the astrolabe, um, to which I will come back in a few seconds. Uh, this is a detail of one uh, at the um, Arts and uh, Museum in Paris. And in the late 1600s, they would have compendia. Uh, so a uh, 
collection of astronomical instruments all merged together. So you have the astrolabe here, you have another kind of astrolabe on the left, you have another kind of uh, equatorium uh, at the bottom, and so on. So th those were very um, um, expensive instruments, of course, because they were made of uh, brass, uh, guild, um, and other uh, very expensive materials. Because the astrolabe is a very rare uh, object to find, especially in Canada, I have found only a few in Toronto at the uh, Aga Khan Museum. Uh, I want to give a, a talk there uh, actually about astrolabes. And they have, if I remember well, they have five or six astrolabes all made in the Middle East uh, between around uh, the years uh, 1200 and 1500 or so. And in Paris, I found it only at the uh, Arts Museum. Actually, not even at the uh, Middle Age uh, Museum. So I decided that I needed my own astrolabe. And um, well, I, I could make one in the, with the computer, which is nice and useful. Uh, by the way, if you want one, I'll send you one. And uh, I actually send a little book with them. Uh, so the book explains how the uh, astrolabe works. But I wanted one in metal. And those in museums, well, they're out of price. I saw a TED Talk once that the guy said they, they're worth about the price of the house and the next house and the next and the next and maybe drop a school in there and so on. So I made my own astrolabe. So this is my astrolabe. It's uh, 10 inches in diameter. The lines I, uh, I engraved with basically um, a nail, <laughs> uh, just a... Uh, a graver's uh, engraver's uh, bit uh, that's used normally just to mark where you're gonna cut metal or drill or whatnot and the back is uh, much less uh, involved so how does it work well you measure the height of the sun don't look at the sun uh, with your own eyes so you would use the shadow for example and you there's a calendar here on the back with don't exactly see it well here. Um, so the on the calendar, you find the position of the sun on the ecliptic. And then you bring back on the other side, you find the position of the sun on the ecliptic, which is here. And you set the, um, the ruler here on the position uh, that you measured in the back. And you adjust to the height that you measured uh, with your eyes. So for example, if I see the sun at uh, 35 degrees in the sky, each line is five degrees. So uh, I go one, two, three, four, seven lines for 35 degrees. And uh, let's say the sun is in uh, Gemini 12. So in Gemini 12, uh, 12 13 degrees, uh, sorry, 35 degrees, it would be um, basically, it would be two o'clock in the afternoon. So that's the um, Astrolabe. Uh, I had a lot of fun making it and I made a smaller one that I don't have here. It's uh, elsewhere in my apartment. It's about uh, four inches in diameter and believe it or not, that one was more difficult to, uh, to make than the big one. So that's it. Um, thank you. If you have any question, I'll be happy to answer. Uh, we have one question here from, uh, from Mick Wilson. He says, fascinating stuff. Do Babylonians also persist in Arabic namings? Um, the, uh, sorry? Yeah, he's, he's wondering, do the Babylonians use Arabic namings? Oh, the, uh, for, uh, for well, uh, yeah. it was before Arabic. Uh, uh, the language, uh, Arabic language can, is a descendant of uh, those languages. They were okay. uh, cognates, uh, same uh, language family, so uh, what we called uh, Semitic languages. And uh, some names have been uh, used by the Arabs and have uh, been transmitted to us. So for example, uh, the two bright stars of the uh, Libra, the scales, uh, are uh, Zubin al-Junubi and Zubin al-Shemali, which are old words that come from Babylonian Zubin, which meant the claw and at the same time, the, the platter of the, the plate of the, uh, the scales. So yes, uh, we can somehow say that uh, many star names somehow derive from Babylonian. Okay. Are there any other questions, folks? If you have them, please uh, type them into the Q&A box. 
I'll just pause for a second here, see if there's any coming up. That was uh, fascinating stuff, Pierre. Uh, it's uh, you obviously have a passion for for the Babylonian history, and I, I'm wondering if it would be possible to get a copy of your slides. If you can email them to me, would that be possible? Yes, no problem. Okay, uh, uh, I'm just. It's going to be a website though, but for the uh, for the ancient astronomical instruments, it's a uh, it's a PowerPoint. Yeah, no, that, that would be great. And then uh, if somebody wants, like, particularly your list of books and so on, yep. so people can have access to that, that'd be super. Uh, just let me see, I've got one more thing here. Uh, wonderful presentation came in through the chat box. So thank you very much. So um, let me just go into gallery view here so I can. Dave, there is one more question. Oh, one more just came in. Here we go. Can you use sundials for astronomy? Yes, actually. I, uh... You need astronomy for uh, drawing the sundial, and you can use the sundial for astronomy. So, for example, uh, if uh, you have a sundial and if you get, uh, for example, uh, parachuted somewhere that you don't know where you are, uh, with the sundial, you'll be able to somehow figure out your uh, latitude. Uh, not your longitude, because this is basically a, a human construct, but latitude almost exists in nature. So it's the angle between the pole and the equator. So by measuring the height of the uh, pole star or the height of the sun for a given date, you'll be able to find your uh, your um, your latitude. And using the sundial, the, the place where the shadow uh, falls on the uh, sundial changes not only with the time of the day, but changes also with the season. For example, in the summer, the sky is higher, the, the, the sun is higher in the sky, so the uh, the shadow will fall closer to the uh, gnomon and further from it in the winter because the sun then is lower. So yeah, you can use the uh, sundial to uh, basically figure out what date it is. Okay, so questions are coming in now. So David's asking, were the Astro Labs used only in the Ptolemaic system or also the Copernican system? Uh, the, the Astrolabe is not uh, about the planets. So I cannot calculate or find the position of the planets with the Astrolabe. That was uh, the, um, the equatorium that was used for that, uh, basically this one. And the Astrolabe, um, the only celestial object that it uh, keeps track of is the sun. So the sun, uh, if you take its path in the sky, it's the ecliptic. It's almost a circle because the Earth around the Sun is almost a circle. Uh, the difference is minor. So what you do is you offset the circle from the uh, the center of the uh, of the uh, the astrolabe, and your calendar is almost exact. Uh, the uh, The difference is very very minor. It's a few hours, not days. So you can. Uh, you can use it with uh, any uh, system because it doesn't follow the planets. So it doesn't matter if we know that the sun is uh, the sun turns around the Earth or the Earth turns around the sun. It doesn't matter. It's the same result. It's really what you see in the sky. Okay, James asks you if you have any thoughts of the Antikythera mechanism. Yeah, the Antikythera mechanism. I would love to uh, to own a copy or make one even more. Um, <laughs> it was basically a computer, um, a numerical, um, uh, mechanical computer, in that they could uh, adjust the dials and um, decide what date they, they they were interested in. And for that date, they would figure out uh, position of planets, the moon, uh, if there was an eclipse and so on. It was very precise. It was working on the Ptolemaic system, of course, but uh, the constants, the mathematical values behind that were had been fine-tuned by observation over centuries, and the Babylonian observations were somehow passed on to the Greeks. Uh, for example, Hipparchus uh, had some contact with the Babylonians. Uh, it's not said, but it's implied. And uh, so they, they knew how to uh, adjust it. So they, they knew how to make the, uh, the gears with the right number of, uh, of uh, teeth and uh, the right diameters and so on. Excuse me. So the, um, the, the, uh, the antiquitary mechanism is a, a wonderful instrument. Uh, there must have been more because it's, it's unthinkable that there would be only one of them, but we haven't found them.
So what happened to the no. others, we don't know. But uh, yeah, maybe one day uh, an archaeologist will find them. Yeah, it'd be amazing to find one in better condition. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so, last question here from here uh, for from Mick again. Um, do you have any experience with the Mughal observatories, such as the Janta Mantor in India or Persia? I cannot say I ever heard about them. Sorry. Okay. Okay. And okay. Uh, so somebody says somebody says here. Uh, Susie says Avanti la musica in Paris has. Brass astrolabs and other instruments for sale. I got a hemispherium and a tidal abacus from 1570. The, the, the thing is, um, those astrolabes sometimes are well, they are reproductions. Uh, rarely they're the original, or else, uh, yeah, a lot of moolah. And uh, the thing is, those that you can find for cheap on the internet or in that kind of boutiques, um, most times they're completely not usable. Uh, for one thing, the astrolabe depends on your latitude. Um, the uh, the ancient astrolabes actually had a, a recessed uh, part in the uh, on the front, in which they could put plates, and they would change plate depending on the latitude that they were interested in or where they uh, they were observing from. Um, mine was made for uh, the latitude where I was living before in Pierrefonds, uh, which is on the island of Montreal in the west part. And now I live off the island, and uh, I'm about uh, half, one quarter of a degree south, and it's not precise anymore. Um, back then, I could have uh, the time precise to five minutes. Now I have uh, about seven, eight minutes of uh, error. Uh, so the astrolabes that you find, sometimes you cannot use them. And another thing, uh, when I gave my talk at the uh, Aga Khan Museum, uh, someone actually brought uh, an astrolabe that they bought in uh, Morocco, if I remember. And um, the the lines on them were so wide, so thick, that you could actually not use them for uh, anything. Uh, and the, uh, the position of the lines also was wrong. So uh, yeah, so basically they're they're made as, I would say, tourist traps. It's sad, but uh, yeah, there are uh, many uh, like that. And um, for astrolabes that are usable, uh, the cheapest ones I found on the internet start around $2,000, uh, and uh, sometimes it's 2,000 euros. There's one guy in uh, Switzerland that used to make them, and now he's retired, Martin uh, Chisol or something like that. And there's a woman in France, Agnes, or Ellen something, I can't remember. And she makes them with laser engraving. So um, I wanted mine made the way they were made back then. So each one of my uh, star pointers like this here has been hand filed. So uh, it took me a lot of elbow grease, a lot of time, but they were hand filed. And uh, my, well, okay, my holes were made with a Dremel, but uh, the, the finishing details were done by hand. So by hand, uh, there was only that uh, Martin guy uh, in uh, Switzerland. So as far as I know, I'm the only guy in the world who makes astrolabes by hand. <laughs> it's a little crazy. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Pierre. We're going to have to move on here. So I really appreciate your talk and uh, look forward to getting your slides and the pointer to your to your website. So I'm just going to have Chris bring up the slides here. Just a second. I was going to replace the spotlight. There we go. Yep. Okay, so we're going to take a five minute break. So this is our, our uh, monthly M&M challenge, uh, Messier and Moon. So if you can, uh, there we go. It'll give you the answer as to what these are after the five minute break. So uh, we'll see you in five.
Works better if I unmute myself. So, okay, folks, I'm just going to get um, Chris to move forward to the next slide here as we finish up our uh, five minute break. So let's see what the answers are. See how well you guessed what they, what they were. So there we go. So the Messier was M109, uh, the Bard Spiral Galaxy, and it was the Embrim Crater from the moon. These uh, pictures that you see here and the cards that we see you see here are the flashcards that you can get from the uh, astronomy science uh, uh, store there. So that's where I'm getting these from. So if you find these interesting, I encourage you to uh, support the science store there. Okay, so I'm going to move on. And uh, I'm pleased to welcome uh, David Schumann, who's going to be talking to us about uh, rockets and space shuttle and rockets. So, David, it's over to you. Uh, uh, Chris is going to stop sharing his screen. And uh, in a second here. Okay, just a minute. There we go. Okay, David, so you're, you're good to go. And I'm going to highlight you as well once I find you on the screen here. Um, Do you see my name? I don't see him. There you are. Okay. There we go. I, uh, Sorry. There we go. Do you see my uh, title? Uh, no, I don't see your slides. No. Oh, okay. Uh, go back to... So click on share screen. Yeah, I did. Uh... There we go. It's coming up now. Yeah. Yep. There we go. So you just need to go into presentation mode and you're good to go. Yeah. Do you see it in presentation mode now, full screen? Uh, no. Then now we do. Yeah. That's yeah. good. Okay. So I'll start. Uh, so hi, um, I'm Dave Schumann. I'm a, wow, I can't believe this, a 30-year member of the Montreal Center. Um, and I've been on the board almost as long and past president. Um, currently, I look into research and development for our center. Uh, in other words, I spend the money. On, uh, on new equipment and toys and um, and that kind of thing. Um, I love astronomy. I love everything to do with the sky, nature, and all kinds of things. But boy, do I love rockets. And as a kid, I was totally fascinated. I was fascinated by going to space growing up in the age of Apollo. And um, uh, as I grew up and became even more interested in this whole thing, um, I used to take trips down to Kennedy Space Center in Florida and uh, so I'm going to share a little of that of my uh, space shuttle experience. Uh, but I'm going to talk about rockets and what is going on today that's so different from the past 15 to 20 years. Um, it's only in the past five years or even less that all of a sudden rockets of all kinds are in the news lately and uh, things are changing very quickly. So um, I'll move ahead. So. About the space shuttles, as many of you know, um, the space shuttle, the idea is that it's kind of like a truck going to space, right? It's like a pickup truck. It's, it's, a, it's essentially a rocket that gets boosted into space. Uh, cargo is left or uh, things are picked up and you can come back down again and, and have it reused uh, over and over, um, essentially a space shuttle. Um, and we're all familiar with the famous NASA space shuttle and even the Buran space shuttle from, uh, from uh, the old Soviet Union. Uh, but did you know that even though the shuttle is retired today, that there's a lot of little mini shuttles going on right now that are not only being used now as we speak, but are in uh, uh, deep development by a few other countries around the world, uh, space agencies, and notably private industry such as Sierra Nevada Corporation and Boeing, for example. So I'm gonna talk about the uh, space shuttle that we all are familiar with. Of course, I don't know if you know, but uh, they were five space shuttle vehicles uh, created by the US uh, government uh, back in the late 70s and, and uh, throughout the 80s, 90s and 2000s. And the shuttle program finally ended, I believe in 2011. So there was the Columbia, the Challenger, the uh, Atlantis uh, Discovery, the Atlantis, and then the Endeavor. The Endeavor uh, actually replaced uh, the Challenger at the time. Um, I, my parents uh, were lucky to have a condominium in Florida, 
unfortunately just three buildings away from the one that collapsed the other day, actually. Um, I still feel bad for that community. Um, but when I was uh, able to go there in the summers in the 90s, I, I took frequent trips to Kennedy Space Center, and uh, I was actually lucky through some photography that I did to get media accreditation. So um, this is what a press pass looks like uh, at the time in 1994 in the summer. Um, I went to photograph the landing of STS-65 that had a Canadian mission on board. Um, so I just wanted to share you um, what this looked like. The pass, uh, the badge at the top was from the US Air Force, as a matter of fact, uh, um, contractor uh, uh, badge. And the green fluorescent one is what you would get to put on the uh, windshield of your car. Um, also, um, being in Florida, I was able to get visitors passes uh, quite often. Um, and the best place to watch rocket launches pretty well for free was to go to, or just a couple of bucks, was to park your car at Jetty Park at Cape Canaveral. And that was just off the, um, the coast uh, of, of, of Cape Canaveral itself, where you could see um, uh, expendable launch vehicles like the Delta and the Atlas take off. And I've seen a few of those as well. So although these photos were taken on film back in the 90s, uh, we didn't have digital like we do today. Uh, this was around, uh, uh, I think it was like 6.30 in the morning. Um, the shuttle Columbia actually um, had to go around the world one more time because of a thunderstorm in Florida. And then finally the sun started coming in and the shuttle landed and there was actually a full moon setting behind it. Um, I was actually literally, um, these were not really zoom pictures uh, that you see with the parachute uh, below. Um, the parachute actually opened up literally not even 200 feet in front of me. You could see with those cars that that was not a zoom lens that took this. Uh, so um, I was able to get quite close. It was with uh, uh, the NBC News uh, crew had allowed me to stay in their area. So I got a good look at the Columbia coming home from space. And uh, I was absolutely blown away. This was a dream of a lifetime uh, being there. Um, uh, it was just an incredible experience. Um, unfortunately, this is one of the shuttles that was uh, destroyed when it uh, returned to the Earth in January of 2003, unfortunately, because of uh, the forward wing on the left side um, had a damage uh, caused by the foam of the orange tank. Um, also, as a uh, regular, regular visitor, I say, um, you take the uh, tour bus and um, the photo on the left is also the Columbia from 1993. Um, the launch was scheduled for the next day and I actually saw it light up from 10 miles away uh, across the Indian River and it didn't go anywhere. And I was wondering, well, what's going on here? Uh, it looks faster on TV. Well, it turns out one of the three engines didn't light up and they scrubbed the, uh, the launch within two seconds before the solids would, would, would light up. So uh, here's a photo that I took um, from the tour bus. Many years later, again, the Columbia, I guess I'm lucky with the Columbia. Um, I was at the visitor's complex and I knew the shuttle had landed. We saw it land from far away because uh, I didn't have a pass at the time. But I knew they were going to tow the shuttle back to the orbiter facility. And lo and behold, I told my friend, let's get back on the tour bus our tour bus was stopped because they had to tow the space shuttle in front of the bus to cross the road to get it to its hangar. Well, what can you do? You have to wait for traffic. And these are the really nice photos I was able to get a uh, close up. Uh, literally, the shuttle had just come back from a two week mission. Now on to uh, today's shuttles. So you'll notice that there's an interesting thing about shuttles of today. They're unhuman or uncrewed. So there's no people in these shuttles, they're automated. And this one is the X-37 from Boeing. It was essentially a demonstrator shuttle system um, based on earlier models. And the idea is that the Atlas V rocket, um, also um, partially uh, under contract from Boeing and Lockheed Martin, also known as United Launch Alliance, uh, launched these rockets, uh, well, once every year-ish. And this shuttle, uh, especially, essentially for the U.S. Air Force, stays in orbit for over a year at a time. 
uh, what it's doing, we're not 100% sure, but it's testing out the demonstrations of, of new technologies and remote sensing. Um, the government is not exactly secret about this. I mean, here's, you know, pictures that people take, uh, pictures from the internet. Uh, you can see on the right here, the, uh, the shuttle, the X-37's cocooned in half of its payload fairing atop the Atlas V. And um, it, um, it does come back. Um, it, you'll, you'll see the, uh, the people in the uh, what look like spacesuits. Keep in mind there's hypergolic fluids that are used, uh, very toxic, uh, um, especially to human flesh. It's very dangerous. Uh, it's um, uh, hydrazine, different chemicals that when they come in contact with each other, instantly ignite. And um, this um, baby shuttle manipulates and moves around in, in orbit using these uh, uh, chemicals. So after being boosted by the, uh, the, the uh, rocket itself. Well, India has a, a burgeoning space program, uh, quite, quite extensive uh, uh, past, uh, um, but they're looking into a, a reusable shuttle system as well, also uncrewed, of course. Uh, here on the bottom left side, you can see um, there was a demonstrator flight with a um, semi-scale model of the uh, shuttle to make sure that the aerodynamics work out. Um, and you could see a closer image of it on the right. But the, the Indian government, the ISRO, uh, are actually uh, pursuing their own version of, uh, of like a miniature shuttle. Um, and these shuttles come back like drones. They come back on the runways. Uh, it's easy to get the payloads off experiments and it's easy to recycle them and send them back up again, uh, uh, you know, just uh, days or weeks later. So that's the idea. Also, um, there was the call for the crew system, for uh, the human crew system uh, to replace the reliance of the United States on the Soviet, uh, well, the, the now the Russian uh, government um, to ferry uh, astronauts to the International Space Station. So one of the companies was Sierra Nevada, Nevada Corporation, and they came up with their concept called the Dream Chaser, which is essentially a baby shuttle. It's like, like a, a shuttle taxi and it, it was supposed to be uh, human rated, but uh, they fell out of favor in the competition in SpaceX Dragon Capsule and the Boeing Starliner, which hasn't gone to orbit with people yet, believe it or not. Um, this was the third competitor and they were not chosen by NASA. However, SNC and, and uh, Sierra Nevada Corporation decided to go ahead anyways and they're turning their Dream Chaser into a cargo version that will be launched on the United Launch Alliance um, um, a Vulcan Centaur rocket, which you see pictured on the right. Uh, this is not concept art or anything. Oh, it's concept art, but this is actually in the books. It's scheduled for next year already. Um, there have been many drop tests done for the Dream Chaser, and it has landed on Edwards Air Force Base in California, um, and it, it's, it's working out quite well. So the next step would be to use it to send cargo to the ISS and uh, a lot of private um, experiments and you know, from private corporations. So you see, it's not just the big governments like NASA or the Indian Space Organization or the ESA, which I'll show you in a minute, that are interested in this, but it's private companies seeing the advantages of a reusable uh, shuttle that's boosted by uh, either a reusable rocket or an expendable one like the Vulcan uh, Centaur. Well, not to be outdone, the European Space Agency back in the 80s had a program called Hermes, which was also a baby shuttle to ferry um, European astronauts to the Columbus module, which is now part of the ISS. Uh, but due to budgetary constraints and the development of the Ariane 5 uh, rocket, that which is in use today, which will be lofting the James Webb telescope soon, hopefully by the end of the year, um, they decided to revisit this program and look into their version of a baby shuttle with a, uh, with a module uh, on the back of, of the uh, shuttle itself that's used to boost and, and propel the, um, the, the shuttle component, which has the cargo, um, into different uh, destinations like the space station, for example. Uh, so it's very versatile and they're uh, well into using this shuttle um, uh, it hasn't been flown yet in space, but it's, it's almost ready. And they're now developing Ariane 6, 
which will have some components of reusability because one new keyword that, uh, especially pushed by SpaceX, uh, is reuse and recycle. In the, in the age of the environment today, um, it's not really cool anymore just to throw rockets in the ocean anymore, you know? We, they, uh, companies are trying to get into the race for making things, uh, if not 100% reusable, at least the booster would, would come back to Earth like we see with SpaceX. So now everybody's doing this mad rush to trying to follow SpaceX's uh, uh, area here. Speaking of SpaceX, I'm going to talk tonight uh, on the rocket side, uh, boosters uh, primarily. Um, and what is a booster? The booster is essentially a device, or you know, in this case, the rocket, that sends a payload into into orbit or into uh, you know, uh, to other planets, interplanetary uh, missions as well. And uh, hopefully uh, humans back to the moon shortly with the Artemis program and also on to Mars, which uh, I know I speak for everyone. We would all say in our lifetimes, we would surely like to see human beings set foot on the surface of Mars. That would be, wow, that would be something else. Um, so SpaceX is special because they're one of the first privately funded companies uh, started by now famous Elon Musk, um, who's perhaps one of the richest people on earth uh, right now with Jeff Bezos, uh, who also happened to form his own space company called uh, Blue Origin. But SpaceX founded a year after Blue Origin um, has actually not only put things into orbit and things towards going to Mars actually, but uh, have successfully um, uh, serviced the International Space Station and brought humans back um, with their Dragon crew system. What's interesting about SpaceX is they have the famous Falcon 9 that we're all used to seeing in the Falcon Heavy, which are essentially three Falcon 9s strapped together, uh, kind of like the Delta IV rocket uh, or the old Titan rockets. Um, but Elon Musk wants everything completely reusable. He wants to fuel up, go to space, do its business, come back down, not shed any components that are, are destroyed or burnt up in the atmosphere, but completely reused, land back on the pad, refuel, go back up. He wants these things to go up three times a day, like an airline. He says the old adage is that when you fly from, let's say, Toronto to uh, London, you don't discard the 747 and build a whole new one just to get back home again. That makes absolutely no business sense. And he goes, unless we can have rapid reusability and reliability, we're not going anywhere. Uh, and we're not gonna colonize, um, or you know, not to use the word colonize, but um, you know, explore Mars and, and settle human beings on Mars or the moon uh, without great difficulty and expense. So what are you seeing here? You're seeing perhaps the next Kennedy Space Center, uh, a very historical site in its own right, it's Boca Chica in Texas. This is in Southern Texas, right near the Mexican border, quite literally at the Mexican border, not far from Civil War history in the Rio Grande River. But today, modern history is being made because Elon Musk has purchased a very large tract of land. And two years ago, he started building tent factories to build the prototypes for his uh, announced Starship uh, rocket. And what is Starship? Starship is essentially the successor to the Falcon program, uh, the Falcon 1 and the Falcon 9, which is being used today, the Falcon 9. Um, and as you can see today, the Falcon 9 actually comes for a landing on barges in the ocean and even back on land at the Kennedy Space Center, uh, except for one failure this past year where the rocket uh, missed the barge because one of the engines blew out. Um, they've had quite a few successful uh, uh, flights, including uh, some being used for the ninth and tenth time uh, um, each. So he really is pushing the reusability of the rockets. But here at Boca Chica, and you can see an aerial view of this, um, and it's grown much more since then. It's grown almost every week. There's something crazy going on there. Um, uh, he is putting all of his energies now into making this um, the next Kennedy Space Center. It's also dubbed Starbase, Starbase Texas. I kid you not, he's trying to incorporate that as a real name 
of a city. So here's a, um, a graphics view of the Starship. And what you see is the super heavy component, which is on the bottom part, and uh, which is essentially the booster to get the Starship. And it's also known collectively as the Starship system. And you can see the backside of Starship in this diagram. Why is it all black? Because yes, it's covered with hexagonal tiles, just like the space shuttle was to survive re-entry uh, when it's coming back to Earth. And uh, it wouldn't land like the shuttle though. There's no wheels or anything. And the wings that you see here are actually for art art articulation. Um, they actually uh, cant and flex uh, to allow this, this essential um, um, body to free fall horizontally as it's falling towards Earth. And then it actually does this belly flip maneuver at the last minute and lands right uh, on its uh, engine side, standing right up. And if you've been following this during the past winter, there have been many explosions, but serial number 15, that's what they're called, they're that 15th iteration of the upper stage Starship, actually did successfully land, albeit with a little fire um, in the engines, uh, successfully. And Elon is so anxious to get into orbit he scrapped serial number 50, uh, 16, put number 15, quote unquote, in a museum. In other words, they moved it to one of the uh, uh, production uh, yards. And he's going full uh, bore on building the super heavy booster right now. Um, and here's a, an artist's conception of that su uh, super heavy component starting to turn back with its ginormous grid fins uh, headed back towards Earth for, for, uh, for a landing, uh, back at um, either an oil derrick, which uh, SpaceX now owns two, Phobos and Deimos. They're old oil derricks that were purchased in Brownsville and uh, in, um, in Mississippi area that he's actually cleaning out and retrofitting to be a launch facility and landing facility for, for the Starship program. And I'll quickly say in a minute why they need oil rigs for this. But right now you can see that the uh, uh, Starship component with the three um, vacuum engines or Raptor or um, uh, Raptor uh, uh, vac engines uh, with their extended bell nozzles that can handle the thrust for uh, the vacuum of space um, would start to go onto its mission in orbit and even be refueled to head towards the moon and and other uh, delivery points. Um, I cannot overemphasize uh, the scale of these things, the project. This is twice as powerful as the mighty Saturn V was with close to 14 million pounds of thrust, no less than 29 Raptor engines, uh, burning methane and uh, liquid oxygen at super chilled uh, temperatures. Uh, here an artist concept of the uh, uh, Starship actually coming in for re-entry. Oh, here's a quick uh, cutaway of what you could see. Um, what's interesting about this rocket, it's 30 meters, uh, 30, I'm sorry, 30 feet in diameter. It can literally hold a thousand people at a time or comfortably hold a few dozen astronauts with plenty of space for living accommodations for long missions to the moon and Mars, believe it or not. Uh, this is the quote unquote luxury liner of, of, of spaceships. Um, to give you a little sense of scale, uh, the integration, uh, launch integration tower, which took NASA's Artemis, uh, the, the launch tower for Artemis, I actually saw it under construction four years ago. It took about four years and a billion dollars to create that. Um, Elon has erected this tower literally within the past month. And it's already taller than the tower for the Saturn V. Um, it may not look like it on the picture on the left, but the launch table alone that you see with the six legs, um, that's the launch pedestal. And there's going to be a launch table where the super heavy and Starship stack will be put onto this with the crane and pulley system that's being assembled in the tower um, at Boca Chica. Um, this is just for testing uh, because eventually uh, think about having the most powerful launches ever. Just the sound alone and the shockwave uh, will be 
will be really tough for that area. It is a natural wildlife uh, sanctuary in the area. And there are residents in Boca Chica and, and nearby uh, Brownsville. And um, eventually they'll have to start launching these things on oil platforms about 20 kilometers away from the coast. Also in international waters, uh, there's less uh, issues with regulations uh, and uh, and other things to to worry about. You can move the platform to the equator for maximum efficiency. On the right is an artist's concept of what the uh, 29 Raptor engines would look like upon launch. 29 of these things. Right now, only three of them were used to uh, to bring the um, Starship, the upper part, um, about uh, 10 kilometers up. Uh, so 29 of these things, uh, it's quite incredible. Uh, here is another aerial view of the nose cones uh, in this windbreaker um, being assembled. And the quick, rapid prototyping and manufacture of these rocket components is Elon's mantra. Rather than take many, many years like Boeing does to build the Space Launch System rocket and then do one test and then we're good to go, let, let's say this November for Artemis 1, uh, Elon says, okay, let's just manufacture the thing, bang, 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 just manufacture it put it out, if it blows up, we learn, we move on. And that is what has happened. So his style of manufacturing and rapid prototyping is very different than the traditional clean room style. Look at this, this is all out in the open in the dirt and, uh, and dust. Uh, here's a picture of the business end with the three central Raptors that uh, have gimbling capabilities. And on the right, you can see uh, for scale, there's a person, and this is on Hawthorne, California at SpaceX headquarters. On the right is the Raptor vacuum engine with the much larger uh, nozzle and bell system used for the vacuum of space. There'll be three of those and three of the central ones on each starship. Um, and there'll be, uh, like I said, 20, up to 29 of these um, uh, sea level engines on the super heavy booster. Um, it just blows me away when, when you think about it. I cannot wait to go down in person to see these launches. Um, yet another artist concept of that uh, horizontal flop maneuver, uh, which we got to see many times successfully. So all the aerodynamics and all of the testing of the flaps, that's been uh, stellar performance so far. It's just getting that belly flop landing um, without it tipping over. And that's mostly because of the legs that you see. Uh, here's a real image of uh, one of the uh, serial numbers uh, that, uh, just before the, the, the launch uh, being prepped. And you could see that uh, launch pedestal in the foreground being prepared. Uh, these pylons were, were literally 200 feet deep into the ground with concrete that were poured a year ago with rebar. Um, I've been through the pandemic. I've been watching every day. I've been getting my daily dose of uh, SpaceX and Boca Chica and kind of spying on what's going on there. Um, it's just astound astounding. A couple of more pictures of real pictures of in-flight uh, um, activity from the Starship. And here you can see onboard cameras. It's quite incredible, this, um, this whole system. So I'm gonna keep the uh, talk moving along. Um, the aftermath of what happens when it doesn't quite land the way it's supposed to. <laughs> um, and unlike uh, the serial number eight, unlike um, what a lot of people thought this would be a museum piece, like kind of a lawn ornament of epic scale. Uh, no, these were all scrapped and recycled, believe it or not. Uh, Elon has only kept number 15 and 16 so far uh, without disassembly. And uh, here, um, one of these frequent screen grabs that you can get online, which I'll, I, I have links at the end of this uh, talk. One kind of weird thing is um, when you have a multi-million dollar rocket prototype, it would be a good idea to make sure it doesn't tip over. And unfortunately, after one successful flight, serial number nine here, um, actually in the high bay, uh, tipped over in, in, uh, in, in the high bay. They were able to rescue it. When I said successful flight, I meant the aerodynamics were successful, but when number eight landed, it, it actually crash landed. This one also didn't survive. It blew up when it landed, but um, they were still able to rescue. It's just incredible to see this thing tilted like that. That was earlier this winter. So um, one crazy final thing about SpaceX is because of the landings and the legs and all these complexities, Elon at Christmas time 
said in a tweet, but we're just simply going to catch these things when they come back from space. We're going to catch them with giant robot arms. And that's exactly what they're building right now at Boca Chica with that giant tower. They plan to literally grab the, the, uh, the, super, uh, the super heavy booster as it's coming down. There's the four grid fins in, in, in an X pattern. And these giant arms are going to actually close in. And then the grid fins will actually rest on top of this. Then the arms will slowly reposition it, refuel it. And within hours, we'll be ready to send another starship uh, back up into orbit again. That's the idea. We'll see if it happens. The first orbital flight will go to Hawaii. It won't quite make one trip around the world, but it'll go from Texas to Hawaii and land in the ocean for a soft landing. Um, uh, and the super heavy com component will come back to Texas for a soft landing in the ocean. And just as a demonstrator, uh, about 100 uh, kilometers north of Kauai in Hawaii. Um, that was expected now in July. Obviously, that's not happening. We're looking now in September. Um, we're always dealing with what's called Elon time. So when Elon Musk says that we'll be on Mars with human beings in 2024, you know, realistically, we're talking more like 2028 or, you know, um, that kind of thing. A couple of more pictures of production, massive uh, cranes. He even built a bar that you can go to on the high bay uh, so that when uh, the public's allowed to go, you can actually go for a drink and a meal and look under your feet as the gantry uh, um, actually assembles these rocket ships. He's like to build 1,000 of these in mass production to be able to colonize, or uh, I know that's not the good word, that's what they say, but to, well, settle on Mars. <laughs> The uh, little uh, thing you see on the left, that's called Starhopper, and that was the original prototype that literally hopped 150 meters with uh, one of the first Raptor prototypes uh, about two years ago, uh, August of 2019. Um, so it's now used as a radar station with cameras and everything pointing towards the launch testing site. Here's also a quick close-up of those hexagonal uh, heat shields. Uh, the tiles are now even being made on site. They just brought in a furnace uh, to Boca Chica to make these things on site. One final thing about SpaceX is they still continue to help uh, deliver uh, payloads for the U.S. military. One of the requirements for the U.S. Air Force is that they have a vertical integration building. So right now they're starting to build a vertical integration building at Complex 39A, which is where the shuttles and the Apollo Saturn uh, 5 for Apollo 11 took off from. SpaceX has a long-term lease and they're stretching the payload fairing to accommodate the much larger US Air Force sensitive uh, satellites uh, to be launched by the Falcon Heavy in the next coming years. Uh, right now, believe it or not, the cadence is one launch a week from SpaceX and there'll be one launch a week uh, from Vandenberg Air Force Base polar launches in, in the coming years. We'll probably have two launches a week so now if you go to Florida for a visit, the odds of you seeing a SpaceX rocket launch um, is quite high. Um, unlike the Atlas and Delta, which fly only about four or five times a year combined. Here's the uh, uh, Dragon crew capsule that we're very familiar with in the past year. So uh, SpaceX successfully uh, completing the contract and fulfilling to deliver uh, people and supplies to the space station and private crews as well. So Tom Cruise is scheduled to film a movie on the ISS next year with one of these private missions. Um, yeah, you heard me right, they're making a movie in space. Why not? So onto uh, something else. Blue Origin was the other big space uh, uh, company with a lot of big dreams. Founded a year earlier, I believe in 2001 by uh, world famous Jeff Bezos, founder of Amazon. He poured tens of billions of dollars into Blue Origin. But so far, Blue Origin has not gone to orbit once. So what the heck is going on here? Well, for starters, Blue Origin developed the New Shepard, and you'll see a pattern here. The New Shepard is a, a small stout rocket with a capsule that can hold, I believe, six uh, uh, paying astronauts, if you say, uh, or, or passengers. And they'll be going into orbit quite literally in about a week and a half from now. Jeff Bezos himself is going to be on the first uh, uh, crewed flight. This goes just to the Carmen line. 
And the Kármán line is the international boundary recognized as, the, well, the boundary of, of space. But this is just quite literally a five minute jaunt up and down. The uh, rocket uh, uh, deploys the capsule, which comes down with a parachute and a rocket motor assisted landing uh, in the desert in Texas at Blue Origins facility. And uh, the rocket booster itself comes down for a touchdown landing. Now it's Blue Origin that originally came up with the concept for um, actually landing on a barge with, with a rocket legs. And if you guys are fans of James Bond, and if you remember the Sean Connery movie, You Only Live Twice, um, as a kid growing up and watching that, I was totally freaked out about that, that silver colored rocket coming down with these legs, just like Tang Tang, for example, with that checkerboard red rocket. Um, it's almost like the fantasy stuff from the 50s and 60s, uh, like the Bonestillian things that we saw in illustrations are almost coming to pass for real life right now. Um, so it's, it's incredible. But uh, it, it really is Elon Musk and SpaceX that have essentially done the rocket landings, uh, even though it's Blue Origin's concept. And yes, they did sue SpaceX and SpaceX One in court saying, um, you know, it, uh, they had the capability of doing the landings as well. Um, so one thing's interesting is that SpaceX, all of their stuff is open source and Elon is not worried about people or companies copying his designs because at that time he's already on to the next thing. He would love to see competition. He wants to get into space. Jeff Bezos is interested in low earth orbit and space station activities, perhaps mining asteroids. Elon really wants to, uh, uh, to settle on Mars, and he really truly believes that we have to be a multi-planetary society. Here's the um, New Shepard, uh, an image of New Shepard. This is a real photo. It's gone up, I believe, 14 times now successfully, including some experiments for NASA, uh, because it is weightless just for, um, you know, just about, a, a not a minute, but just under a minute, actually. Um, here's the gantry to get to it. Here it is in flight, and it has just one engine um, burning uh, hydrogen and oxygen. And here is an image of the capsule on that. Uh, it looks like a hard landing, but it's supposed to be soft uh, with a, a rocket powered landing at the very last second to cushion the blow of landing on land. Uh, this is a new thing. I, I know that the Dragon capsule ends up in the water, uh, just like the days of Apollo, Mercury, and Gemini. but like these uh, Russians and Soviets and the Chinese, uh, Blue Origin and um, uh, some other companies want to land on land, like Boeing as well, just to make things uh, easier, uh, less logistics in the, in the water. Um, so you could see these fins sticking out. Uh, these grid fins uh, help slow down and steer uh, the booster on its way back down with its four legs. Uh, Mannequin Skywalker, yes, um, actually had an anthro, I can't say that word, a human analog uh, for testing um, in one of the last flights a few months ago that was uh, quite successful. So it's now cleared for a human flight for this month. David, about 10 minutes. Okay, uh, so uh, there you got uh, Jeff Bezos standing next to his uh, creation. So here, is the real thing that Jeff Bezos really wants to work on, it's New Glenn. And this is the ultra booster that would take heavy components into space and uh, help NASA go um, perhaps back to the moon and everything. But this is under such long development issues that um, uh, right now the, blue, uh, the, the New Glenn is still just a mock-up concept. And although uh, components like at the launch tower have been constructed in Florida. Um, there's real no testing of these engines right now um, and no components from Blue Origin have gone into orbit yet. Uh, here's the Blue Origin factory and an artist concept that's in Florida. They're very, very secretive, unlike SpaceX, which is quite open. Um, here's an artist concept in uh, Launch Complex 34 in, in Florida. Now they're slated for the first flight two years from now. And here's that booster landing back on, on a barge in the ocean. 
enormous uh, payload capacity though, seven meter fairing, and that's quite large. Um, you know, Hubble sized telescopes, uh, you know, could be transported in these very large fairings. Blue Origin's not only making the engines for themselves though, it's United Launch Alliance's Vulcan Centaur rocket that'll be using two of these engines later this, well, it was supposed to be later this year in a planned flight. Now there's technical problems with this engine and that might be holding back the first flight, which will be the Peregrine flight to the moon, by the way, uh, on that Vulcan Centaur. So unlike SpaceX, it looks like Blue Origin's kind of behind right now. Speaking of United Launch Alliance, which is, like I said, a partnership between Boeing and Lockheed Martin to, well, um, construct, build, and manage the Delta and Atlas rockets. Um, their new offering is the uh, Vulcan Centaur, which will replace the Delta IV, which has been retired in four flights. The before Delta heavies left, and um, the Delta is finished, just like the Titan series. Atlas will still go on for a few years. It's booked up for another four or five years, but it'll quickly be replaced by the, the Vulcan Centaur. As a matter of fact, the launch pad was retrofitted for it recently. It also uses strap-on motors, and right now only the engine pod is being considered for uh, reuse uh, by going back to, the, uh, to Earth with a special shield that would be it, like an inflatable shield that would come back with a parachute. Here's testing uh, from Northrop Grumman uh, um, Orbital ATK Alliance, uh, the makers of the space shuttle boosters. Um, they successfully uh, tested the uh, strap-on motors, which are quite large, actually. And here's that smart reuse where they're going to recycle those engines only in the future, though. ULA claims that it's just not worth it for the upper stage of the rocket to be reused for the expense. It's like, uh, you know, quite a big part of the expense is the, uh, the rocket engines themselves. And here's that uh, Peregrine uh, lander that's supposed to go to the moon. It was supposed to have been this December. A comparison of different uh, uh, rocket um, nose cones, and, and here's that, an image of a whale, for example. And you could see Starship uh, is, is the king of the hill here with the largest interior volume. Um, compared to everybody else. But uh, we really are in the glory days of, of, of rockets. Here's a graphical comparison of the Starship versus the uh, um, these, um, Space Launch System, the new Glenn when it comes out, uh, the classic uh, Falcon 9, and the Vulcan Centaur, um, and the Electron rocket, which I'll talk about quickly in a minute, which I'll talk about right now. Uh, rocket Lab, a new startup company by Peter Beck, um, based in the United States, but launching out of New Zealand, uh, has used carbon fiber and electric fed engines, the Rutherford engines, um, clustered in nine, to actually send microsats into space. That's the new space race now too. Um, everything like electronics have become smaller and smaller, and now it doesn't take much to get these uh, small sats into orbit. They've had about uh, 15 successful flights and one failure this winter. Uh, but they are back on track for another flight. Um, this is off the uh, coast of New Zealand, and um, they are not going to be outdone because uh, Peter Beck recently said that he would never go into reusability, but because the industry is forcing that way, um, they are looking into reusing the booster. But now he announced not only the Electron, but he's announced the... Um, uh, the neutron rocket, which is quite a bit larger and will be fully reusable. Um, he said he would eat his hat when that day came. So a few months ago in the wintertime, Peter Beck literally sat down uh, at a press conference and put his hat in a blender and literally started eating his hat. As you can see here, this is no gag. You can see it on YouTube. Uh, so yeah, the electron rocket looks a little like the Falcon 9 style uh, pop-up legs that land. And the, the Chinese are starting to copy this, the, the Russians as well. Virgin Galactic, I'm going to speed up here, uh, is also ready for flight. Uh, they're going to go up with Sir Richard Branson um, next week, actually, on their first passenger flight. After a couple of tragedies in the past few years, um, uh, they're now ready to go. Um, the White Knight 2 uh, launch plane actually launches this rocket plane into space and it uses its feathered wings to come back to Earth uh, softly. And um, 
it really is futuristic and 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 really uh, like you know definitely looks like a, a chrome spaceship it's really beautiful Th this gives you a little more uh flight time uh, than the one from jeff bezos the new uh the new shepherd you could see it looks more like an airplane inside instead of a capsule and uh you'll be able to tilt the entire ship for different views of the earth um so for your quarter million dollars you do want the best view possible i would imagine you can Reserve tickets for these things right now if you want to, if you have the money. Um, I certainly don't, but I wish I could. Um, and this is uh, one of the future private spaceports uh, that was built in, uh, in, the, in Mojave um, in, the, uh, in the desert. And uh, many companies that are now starting to, to think of sending people into orbit uh, you, you know, at this facility. Um, so space tourism, and, and uh, these are real pictures, space tourism, um, yeah, it's uh, maybe not a thing for multi multi millionaires, but maybe upper middle class people if they save a quarter million dollars. That's not completely out of reach for some people. Maybe you can go into uh, space for a few minutes. Um, I don't know if we thought we'd see this day. Virgin Orbit is a division of Virgin that actually sends microsats as well using a modified 747 called Launcher One. And they'll be launching out of Cornwall in, uh, in, um, in England and out of uh, California and other locations in the United States and around the world. Using the 747, they successfully launched a Tubular Bells uh, commercial satellite uh, uh, just a few days ago on their third uh, flight. Two successful flights. The first flight was not a success. But in the rocket industry, it's really hard. SpaceX Falcon 1 it took them four tries before and almost bankruptcy before they successfully uh, went into space. But NASA and other private companies are booking on this rocket already. This, uh, this launcher is, has been booked up for the next few years. Also working on an SST, uh, supersonic transport, um, going back to the days of the Concorde, but with a 20, uh, uh, 21st century uh, twist. This is in development, right? My final one is Astra, another small company. I'm only talking right now about rockets that actually exist, that actually fly, but there's many companies like Relativity Space and others from Germany and from China and even Russia that are working on designs for uh, small rockets and, and medium-sized rockets. But at Astra, not at Astra, but Astra, uh, 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 Poker Flats in, in um, Alaska, uh, has done a few test flights of their uh, small rocket, um, um, not too successful yet. There's been some well, accidents, but you could see this bullet-shaped rocket. Uh, it doesn't take much facilities to get it uh, uh, ready for uh, launch. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, you see, uh, you know, it didn't quite make it. But it's one of the most scenic launch areas uh, in North America with the mountains of Alaska. It's pretty incredible. And finally, on the NASA side, as we're all familiar with the Artemis, uh, which is essentially a derived design from the uh, uh, Apollo days, the space shuttle. Um, this orange tank is not a stretched external tank of the shuttle. This is a wholly new designed tank. It's the same diameter, but it has the thrust structure and weight for, for the um, uh, thrust that these two extended uh, stretched solid rockets uh, will, will put on this whole thing. And they were successfully test fired a year ago, twice. And the center core was successfully hot fired for eight minutes this past winter after a technical issue that uh, Boeing had earlier. Uh, this is stacked. Even part of the uh, tapered cone is stacked now in the vehicle assembly building in Florida, right now at the vehicle assembly building. And the NASA wiggle, wiggle worm of years past is back in fashion. And the first flight of the Orion uh, uncrewed capsule it's supposed to be late November of this year, if nothing goes wrong with the stacking and the software. The second flight will feature a Canadian uh, with the crew going around the moon with four uh, astronauts. And hopefully in 2024, 25, a human landing for the first time since Apollo 17. Um, this time we'll have women land on the moon and uh, that would be a fantastic day for humankind to celebrate. Um, just a quick note here, there is a controversy going on. Of course, SpaceX won the contest for the lunar lander component using its ginormous Falcon, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Starship. 
Uh, of course, uh, Jeff Bezos is suing the U.S. government, and they are looking into perhaps awarding him in August $10 billion for his unusable, reusable uh, lander, which is kind of like a, a, a later version of the uh, um, Eagle lander, uh, like a modern version of it. But the Starship from SpaceX is, is completely reusable. Uh, here, an artist concept of a uh, future space station being developed uh, by um, Axis, um, Axiom Space. This is actually under construction right now. And it, it will be connected to the ISS and then uh, sent on its own after it was uh, constructed. So that ends my talk. Um, I have uh, just uh, these um, are some of the uh, links that you can find uh, um, on YouTube uh, vlog channels, which have like, if not weekly, uh, every other day content. The Angry Astronauts, one of them I'm a patron of. And um, he's kept me company during the tough times of the COVID lockdown. And I also uh, had some time because, um, you know, I couldn't work for five months. So uh, I went into a deep dive into all the space stuff. Um, so I thank you kindly for your time. And I thank the Ottawa Centre for having me uh, on tonight. And um, I'm open to any questions. Yeah, well, thank you very much, David. That's that's a, a very a fascinating presentation. And uh, if I could ask you, uh, when you get an opportunity, if you can just email me your slides or send me a link to the slides, that would be great. I sure can. Okay, that, that's great. So thank you very much. We're going to quickly move, uh, unless we've got any questions here. Um, I'm going to, if, if there are questions, uh, if you can just put them in the Q&A box, and, and David, if you can just type the answers in, because we've got to move on to the observations here. Yeah. So hang on a second, uh, replace spotlight. And I'll there we go. Oh, in, uh, five minutes, there's no questions. Okay, no, no, uh, okay, thank you. Thanks. And uh, so first person up for the observations, side-by-side -side gallery, and I gotta remove the spotlight here. Side-by-side uh, -side gallery, I'm not seeing the gallery here. Uh, there we go, sorry about that. Okay, so John Thompson, uh, you are up. So uh, let me spotlight you. There we go. Yeah, am I, I am muted? Yeah, you're not very loud though, John. Yeah. Okay, uh, this one was from the previous month, in fact. That was taken on May 28th. It just happened that Mercury, Planet Mercury was well uh, positioned to be seen over the entire month. And I met from May 14th to May 28th. I managed nine observations of, of Mercury and um, that was, I think, the last one. That, that, that's Venus and Mercury, and they're only 0 0.4 degrees apart that night. But even though the telephoto lens, they were very close together, so I had to crop it and blow it up in order to see, because by that time, Mercury was a very tiny crescent approaching the sun and in a bright twilight sky as well. So it was getting near, well, it wasn't visible to the naked eye. It was even barely visible with binoculars. But anyways, there, that, that was like, that's less separation than the diameter of the full moon. Uh, next slide. Uh, now this is, an, oh, is that supposed to be an animated GIF? Is that, uh, is that running? Okay, there it goes. Um, from where I was observing, when the, when the eclipsed sun rose, it was in the clouds and it wasn't until 10 minutes later that it actually cleared the clouds but this is a sequence that was taken with a 500 millimeter mirror lens and, uh, and a beta solar filter. And uh, what it does is it shows the sort of the apparent rotation. That, inter that entire set of uh, pictures is a 13 minute interval from 10 minutes to 23 minutes after sunrise. And I also put down the time and the, uh, the angle, position angle for each of them. It's just a, mainly a geometrical effect as the moon, which is smaller than the sun crosses it, it makes that uh, apparent rotation. Like people in Montreal saw it rise with the horns pointed to the right. And most people in, the, in uh, Ontario saw it with the horns pointed to the left. Um, even mine is just barely to the right. But um, there was one image by Pam Weston, I think some people know her, that in Perth, uh, shows it rising with the horns pointing to the right because she was able to get it right at sunrise. At that point, the rotation had made it turn the other direction. 
<laughs> Anyways, I thought that was interesting because you don't normally see that. that the 81 degrees of rotation in 13 minutes. So other people, I think, will be showing a bigger picture, but this is like a close-up. Okay. Thank you very much, John. Okay, so um, this is my high-tech, high-res picture. This is what I used in front of my cell phone camera, which is the, uh, the Eclipse glasses. And this is taken from uh, Shirley's Bay. And then I, I got sort of frustrated with the quality of that. And so I then uh, said, okay, I'm just going to uh, change the settings on my camera. So the next slide. So I went for one four thousandths of a second, ISO 50, and uh, pointed it straight at the sun to see what would happen. I, got, I thought it was a pretty neat picture. But then when I zoom in on the picture, which is the next slide, you can actually see um, a relic of the, of the uh, an optical relic of the actual eclipse right above the, the brightness of the sun there. And I thought that was uh, rather cool. So that's, that was taken at uh, Shirley's Bay. Okay, um, I think that's it for my slide. So next one up is Pavel. Just give me a second here. Yeah. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Just check yep. the audio while we're not. All right, great. Yeah, that just give, let me just to uh, replace the spotlight. There we go. Okay. All right. Um, so this is actually a video. Um, you just play the video. Um, kind of, it's forty six seconds long. Uh, this is a time lapse of the eclipse, and you really see that effect. Um, that was being talked about before. Oh, it's a little bit laggy on on my Zoom, but that's okay. You, you'll get the effect. There it is. Um, so I was over at Peachtree Island, uh, looking at it over the water. It's much smoother. The, the, the real video is, is actually running at, I think, 30, 30 frames per second or something like that. Uh, but you really see that effect um, that was just being talked about of the moon kind of going a little bit slower than the sun across the sky um, and the clouds uh, that were mentioned. Uh, this was taken with just a simple DSLR. This is an old Nikon D3300 I got off of Kijiji um, through a homemade Vader solar filter made out of cardboard um, that I actually made for my binoculars, but it turns out it fits perfectly on, on the front of the camera. Um, so this was just with the, 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 the basic lens. Uh, I believe every picture was uh, ISO 100 uh, and uh, a fifth of a second exposure, I think, something like that. Um, uh, yeah, um, it worked out really, really well. Um, all of the software that I used for processing the images and making the video was completely free. And the software to get the camera to take, you know, pictures in sequence, I, I believe it's five seconds between each image, was also uh, free software. Uh, so if anyone's interested in kind of learning how to do this, I've been playing around with it. I've been taking, you know, those like cool time lapse videos of of the stars moving, you know, rotating, you can see the rotation and everything. Um, I'd, I'd be happy to kind of do a little tutorial or something. Obviously I can't do it now, but, uh, but yeah, it was, uh, it was a really cool experience and it was kind of a spur of the moment thing. Uh, went out there, tried out the same technique I used to get the, the star trails and, and it worked out great. Yeah. So, well, if you want to do that for a future meeting, just flip me an email and I'll try to slot you in. Okay. Yeah, sure. Super. Thank you very much. So I'm going to uh, move on to, Oh, our president, Stephen. Yeah, hello again. Um, on the morning, I got up for me ridiculously early, and uh, <clears throat> I was fortunate. I'd scoped out a field just down the road and uh, kind of threw the tripod and everything on the shoulder and slept down. Uh, initially, completely clouded, as I imagine a few other people found from their locations. However, a uh, short while, I managed to get this picture, which I didn't think was too bad. Uh, next one, uh, Chris. Later on, the clouds came in, and I actually find that the clouds like this add a little bit of drama to the picture. So I, I actually prefer this picture to, to, the, uh, to the clean one. Uh, as far as how what I was using, uh, next slide, Chris. Um, I was using an off-axis solar filter. Uh, it's actually for my Questar telescope, but I found it fit right in the light shield of, of my telephoto lens. Uh, obviously not threaded, which is why the, the, um, the tape 
uh, to make sure that nothing uh, went astray at the wrong moment. I was a little concerned about using an off axis on a standard lens, but to my surprise, it worked just fine and didn't seem to be an issue. Uh, as you can tell though, uh, next time I plan on putting a uh, cardboard shield around it as uh, the, uh, it does make, without it, it does make viewing the uh, uh, screen and the viewfinder a little awkward. Anyway, that's it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Chris. Uh, am I muted? I can't tell. Huh? No, you're, you're live. Okay, thank you. Um, as people know, uh, the only way to see this eclipse was to have an unobstructed view of the, uh, to the, to the east, really right down to the horizon. <laughs> Uh, had the thought that if I find the right place on the shores of the Otto River, not only will we have uninterrupted view, but we can compose the uh, the sunrise to happen right over the downtown, and in this case, you can see here uh, right over Parliament Hill. So the plan was to have the the sunrise behind the buildings, and the first full view of the disc in the eclipse I wanted to have right over Parliament Hill. Great theory, but as Stephen said. Clouds, of course, moved in, and uh, I missed that exact moment when the um, when the uh, the first uh, eclipse sun would be right over the, uh, the the spire of Parliament Hill, but still a, a dramatic place over over the downtown. Um, but then, as it rose, and as Stephen said, the the clouds actually made it a far more interesting event. So this is just one typical shot, and uh, I was there with uh, a few others from the from the center, including Paul Kloniger, and he's going to talk about a similar image and the uh, the the, um, the reflection of light you can see coming out of the uh, the horns of the uh, the sun, um, and the, the view as it uh, as it progresses. So, thank you. That's it. Okay, uh, Bob Olson. How do you do? Uh, no eclipse photos. I don't do five a.m. well. Um, this is uh, one of our challenge objects, uh, and uh, it's basically a galaxy cluster. Next slide, please. And you can actually see it better in the uh, reversed image. Uh, most of the little gray spots are uh, galaxies. Uh, the stars have spikes on them. Uh, there is a uncountable number of galaxies. Next slide, please. Uh, this was suggested to me by Mike Wirths. It's a uh, open cluster, uh, very, very faint. This is a five hour exposure. And you can see it's uh, got some wonderful colors in it. Next slide, please. This is our old favorite Stefan's uh, Quintet. Uh, I've seen this in a telescope and when you uh, look at it, uh, when you look at it, um, it's um, in a telescope, it's just a bunch of uh, very faint uh, um, gray areas. Uh, this is overprocessed like crazy. Uh, next slide, please. But uh, it shows them better than, than I normally get them. Next slide, please. This is an edge-on galaxy with a pretty nice uh, dust lane down the middle of it. I uh, really like it a lot. And last. This is the elephant's trunk. I have imaged this probably half a dozen times, but the colors in this particular version that I did this month are probably my best effort yet. Uh, it's for me, a really attractive area of the sky. There's things everywhere. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you, Bob. Or uh, Taras, you're up. I tell Ross, you appear to be muted. Um, so these yeah, two images were in between March 14th. That's the image on the left and uh, May 18th. Uh, one on the right, uh, when the planet was uh, at its maximum elevation that month. Um, if viewed from, uh, well, that month, um, if viewed from Earth, of course. Both pictures were taken when the planet was about 15 degrees above the horizon. 
um, on May 14th, Mercury was 7.6 arc seconds in size and the phase was uh, waning crescent. Uh, four days later on May 18th, it reached 8.4 arc seconds in size while the crescent became even thinner. It's not really noticeable in pictures, but uh, um, it was slightly smaller that day. And uh, the planet was about uh, 60 million kilometers from sun and 119 million kilometers away from Earth. Next slide, please. So, of course, the biggest astronomical event of recent months was the solar eclipse. This was taken on uh, um, 5.21 a.m. from Shirley's Bay uh, location along Aura River. We were together there with uh, Dave Chisholm and uh, Konstantin Popov. This was taken just the moment after the sunrise and when the clouds partially parted. So it was surprise, surprise, clouded that morning in Ottawa. And um, the moment when the, the sun showed up, it was just a, this thin um, uh, segment showing up, uh, which I captured on this picture. Let's go to the next slide. 10 minutes later, the sun was quite bright. So I had to use the solar filter and uh, the cloud pattern changed as well. Uh, you can see that uh, uh, there is a top part of the crescent and just a tiny bit of the lower part showing up on the right, uh, while the clouds are covering the lower part. Let's go to the next slide. Another three, minute, another three minutes at 5.33, and uh, that's when I took this picture, where uh, the, there were still clouds, but... Um, they didn't show up on this picture because I took this picture with longer exposure. So the light from the sun got well exposed even through the thin clouds. You can see a bit of the scenery there as well, uh, like the reflection on the surface of Oro River and the tree line far away. And five minutes later, there was maximum coverage of solar disk by the disk of the moon, but I couldn't take it because the clouds came in again. Um, Let's go to the next slide. Uh, 20 minutes later at 5.52, I took this picture after a period of clouds again. As you can see, the moon position changed. The shape of the solar crescent changed as well. Moon was moving farther away from the sun and uh, it was uncovering more and more of the solar disk. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So the same night when I took the second picture of um, Mercury, and I think uh, Oscar just asked, why is there two pictures? Just because I composed them, two pictures in one to save uh, the time and they're tiny. So um, I fit two images of Mercury in this picture. So the same night I took this picture of the moon on May 18th, and um, um, it shows Caucasus mountains in the center and a bit of uh, happenings to the left. Uh, up in Montes, uh, close to the termina Terminator line. What's special about this image is the amount of details, which was due to the fact that I used Jim Thompson's tip for using infrared filter for such cases. Infrared part of spectrum having longer than visual light wavelengths is less susceptible to the impact of bad seeing conditions, and it produced more stable picture. Uh, now you can see a little uh, craters more uh, distinctively on this picture, as well as some reels, other lunar details. And uh, it's because I use the infrared filter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Taras. I'm going to turn it over to Andrea. Hello. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, good. Uh, this is a nebula picture that I took with uh, my astronomical camera. It's the Bat Nebula and the Squid Nebula. And this is, was kind of a complicated image to create. And if anybody ever has any questions about how I take my images, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, this was taken with uh, narrowband filters. So I used an oxygen filter and a hydrogen filter and a monochrome camera. And the reason for that is the red nebula, which is the bat, is very high in hydrogen emissions. So it shows up pretty easily with a hydrogen filter. 
the squid nebula, which is the blue nebula, is extremely faint. It took me probably six hours of oxygen uh, imaging only just to extract this little, bit, little blue nebula. It's located in Cepheus. It's um, quite big. Uh, I could have used an even wider field of view. And it was taken with a, an astronomical camera, the ZWO533 color camera. No, no, mono camera. No, so it must have been the six, 2600, sorry. Next image. This is just a picture of the Milky Way. I got a chance to go to a, a dark sky site. And this was um, an image where I actually connected my astronomical camera to a regular camera lens, a 35 millimeter lens for a wide angle. And then it was tracked on a star tracker. Next image. The same night I used a different lens. I put um, an 85 millimeter lens on the astronomical camera. It was the uh, ZWO 2600 color camera. And this is the Rho Ophiuchi uh, region. It's a remarkably colorful and beautiful part of the sky just next to the Milky Way. And it's up in the sky now um, for your viewing pleasure, if anybody would like to look at it. Next. Next slide. Ah, this one was taken with the 533 color camera. It is the fireworks galaxy. It's also located in Cepheus. And the galaxy itself is very, very, very distant. And it is seen in the sky with, it's often framed with this uh, other star cluster, which you can see at the bottom. They are in the same part of the sky, but they are nowhere near each other in space. The fireworks galaxy is much, much further away. This was shot with the hyperstar lens on the Celestron Schmidt Cassegrain. And well, I think it was taken around the time actually of the uh, solar eclipse because we did have a string of beautiful clear nights around June 10th and 11th. Next. And this was my, uh, one of my images from the solar eclipse. This is a blended image and I took several images. The reason you do a blend is that I took an image of the sky and the trees without the solar filter and I took it before the sun rose. So there's, it was just beautiful dawn colors. And once you put the solar filter on, you can't see any of the background. So the image of the sun rising was taken um, with the solar filter on, but these two images were taken at the exact same location with the same camera. And it was a regular DSLR and a 400 millimeter lens. Um, I took some other images. I, I didn't seem to have the clouds that other people had. This was up at Penny's Point and I put them onto the Facebook page. And um, just as a fun story, the picture I posted with the sailboat, there was a sailboat right in my line of sight and the sailboat owners found me and I sent them a picture of the eclipse and their sailboat. So that was wonderful. And those are, that's the end of my images. Hey, thank you, Andrew. So we're gonna turn it over to uh, Jim Sophia. Okay, thank you. So this is a portion of the Vale Nebula a supernova remnant referred to as the witch's broom, NGC 6960, spanning about two light years across in the constellation Cygnus. I was using my Celestron 8 uh, SCT with the Mallenkamp Sky Raider camera and the IDEAS NBX filter. Total exposure time is five and a half minutes. The image was post-processed with Topaz Studio. Next one, please. This supernova that I was speaking about uh, occurred approximately 8,000 years ago, and the shock waves are still traveling away from the blast and colliding with the surrounding gas, which create the appearance of delicate threads and filaments that we can observe in this capture of the East Vale Nebula, NGC 6992. Like the previous one, this image was taken off my balcony using the Malencam Sky Raider camera and the NBX filter. Total exposure time, seven and a half minutes. 
and the image was later post-processed using Topaz Studio. Next one, please. And this is a crop image of the Crescent Nebula, an emission nebula in the constellation Cygnus, about 5,000 light years away. It is formed by a collision between the stellar wind from a massive wolf Riot star, and that's the bright star in the center, and the slower moving wind and material ejected by the star when it became a red giant about 300,000 years ago. This image was taken with my 80 millimeter refractor, the Mellencamp Sky Radar camera, and the Optolong L-Enhance filter. This is a three minute exposure followed by post-processing with Topaz Studio. Next one, please. And some observing of solar prominences in between. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Jim. So I'm gonna turn it over to Paul uh, Kleininger and uh, just a second here. Um, side by side gallery. Oh, sorry, I'm just, I'm having trouble with my mouse. There we go. I was doing a presentation this afternoon and my, the battery died on my mouse. But uh, Paul, it's, it's all yours. Thanks, Dave. Well, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I hope all of those uh, folks out there that managed to get up on the early morning of June 10th to watch the eclipse enjoyed the view. And for those who didn't, I prepared a short sequence of images here to share the view I had. Uh, I was set up on the south shore of the Ottawa River, about 14 kilometers southwest of the Peace Tower, along with Chris, his wife Louisa, and Oscar Echeverry. This eclipse was challenging on a number of fronts, such as the event's low elevation and a bank of incoming pesky clouds, with the, which others have mentioned, uh, that threatened to hide the event on us. This image uh, is a vertical mosaic of the sky directly above the sun's position at several intervals just before and shortly after sunrise. The base of the low clouds was just a couple of degrees above the horizon, and this allowed the sun to light them up even while it was still below the horizon. The effect was a bit like a sun dog and allowed us to monitor the sun's position. Unfortunately, our view for the first couple of minutes after sunrise was obscured by the fat complex of high rises just to the left of the Peace Tower. This set of images was taken with an unfiltered 200 millimeter lens on a tripod. All the rest of the images I'll show you were taken with an Orion glass solar filter covering the lens, and so only strong solar illumination was recorded. But as you'll see, even with a good portion of the sun covered, its light was still intense enough to illuminate the nearby clouds. Next one, please, Chris. So this short image sequence was taken with a stationary 200 millimeter lens and begins about nine minutes after sunrise and still some 17 minutes before maximum eclipse. The sun and the moon were at just over one degree of elevation here over the city skyline, but unfortunately still hidden by a low bank of clouds. You can see the sun starting to climb higher and increasingly lighting up the thinning clouds still above it, uh, making for a pretty interesting play of light. However, at just 13 minutes before maximum, the sun and the moon were still being obscured. Fortunately, they did manage to climb up above that low cloud band and at about six and a half minutes before maximum eclipse, they posed for this lucky capture. The sun pillar generated above through some remaining thin clouds looked like an enormous searchlight scanning the sky. This turned out to be my favorite catch of the event. My remaining images were all taken with a 600 millimeter lens and a camera, and the camera was tracking on a star adventurer amount to keep the sun and the moon in the field of view. And at 10 minutes before maximum, they started to ascend through the cloud bands. At seven and a half minutes before maximum, we were finally seeing the full crescent sun. And a minute and a half later, hallelujah, clear sky at last. The following sequence shows the progression of the moon across the sun's face, with images taken about 20 seconds apart. What really struck me at this point was how quickly the orientation of the crescent sun was changing as we approached the maximum. The apparent counterclockwise rotation was rapid and quite obvious, as others have mentioned. Ah, maximum eclipse and the sun and the moon were sailing in a sweet spot of clear sky. As it turned out, we were very lucky to get that clear break when we did. 
And for the next 12 minutes of the event, we had an unobstructed view of the moon moving across the solar disk. Uh, but then they came, the cloud spirits had returned. And for the remaining 48 minutes of the eclipse, they obscured the view to various degrees. I've only included a handful of images here from this portion of the event to show this. All of these images were of the same exposure length, and that shows how much the sun's brightness varied from moment to moment at our location. Although I was initially a bit disappointed by the clouds, they actually made for some very interesting views of the sun. And after all, we did have that clear 18 minute long window where it mattered the most. Definitely a case of the glass being at the very least half full. Finally, I thought a fast moving time lapse here would really illustrate the dynamics of the moon's transit. Don't blink, this is 28 minutes compressed into about eight seconds. It was an enjoyable eclipse indeed. All right, next slide, please, Chris. In this final image, I, I love the play of the clouds here with the finger like tendrils looking like they were reaching out to hold the sun. But what also struck me here was the perspective this, this view gave of distance and time. Here were these clouds just some few kilometers away from us, partially covering our nearest neighbors in space, the moon at just over one light second away and our nearest star of the sun at about eight and a half light minutes distant. Next slide, please, Chris. This is in stark contrast to my final image this evening and one of our challenge objects from last month, the ABLE 2065 galaxy cluster. At 1.1 billion light years away, this stunning concentration of over 400 galaxies in Corona Borealis is one of the member clusters making up the much larger Corona Borealis supercluster of galaxies. The galaxies here are so distant that they are actually receding from us at about 7% the speed of light due to the expansion of the universe. Most of the objects that you see here are in fact galaxies with only a few stars, uh, the brighter ones with the points on them, the diffraction spikes, uh, visible. As I say, most of, the, most of these objects are just galaxies. This image itself is a stacked exposure of 130 minutes taken with my 11 inch Edge HD at F7 with a Canon 60DA camera. Just to give you an idea of how packed these things are in, in that portion of the sky, the field of view here is a little bit less than half the size of the sun or the moon as seen from Earth. It never ceases to amaze me that our tools can let us observe events in our celestial backyard, such as the solar eclipse, and then also see so far out into the universe that the light from these galaxies left them long before the first complex plants and animals even appeared on dry land here on Earth. Certainly food for thought. That's it for me. Clear skies, everybody. Stay safe. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. Okay, so moving on, our observing challenges for last month uh, are listed here. The Messier 84, NGC 5689. The advanced challenge was AGC 2065, and the lunar challenge was Crater Poseidonus. And for this month, our beginner challenge is Messier 15 as a globular cluster in Pegasus. And then our intermediate challenge is IC5146, a nebula in Cygnus, also known as the Cocoon Nebula. All of these will be published in our astronauts. So uh, look, uh, that should be coming out in the next week or so. So uh, I'm moving through these fairly quickly, so you can reference them from there. Next one, we have the advanced challenge, which is uh, P's one planetary nebula within M15, and uh, very, very small. Uh, so uh, three arc seconds by three arc seconds across. Okay, uh, next one. We have our lunar challenge, Crater Goldschmidt. Okay, it's an impact crater near the northern limb of the moon. And so let's see if we can get any pictures of that this month. There's a summary of the, uh, the four challenges there. And thank you to Oscar for pulling these together each month for us. 
So Chris, do you want to speak to this? Okay, thank you, David. Um, we've put this slide up before, but uh, just to repeat the announcement that there's a, a music concert, classical piano concert uh, being held outdoors at the uh, Pontiac Enchanté uh, Music studio, studio. And it's gonna have an astronomy theme. Uh, in fact, they'll be playing the entire uh, Gustav Holtz, uh, The Planets. And uh, we'll have a presentation on uh, the Perseids, it's peaking right then from uh, Stefan Papa of Astro Pontiac as well as uh, live views uh, displayed by Jim Thompson on a screen while the uh, uh, presentation's going on, both the astronomy talk and the, uh, the, the planet's uh, musical presentation. So you can get tickets online uh, for this uh, dinner and music performance. Okay, thank you very much, Chris. And he did send an email out to our group uh, with a link for that as well. Okay, next slide. Good news, Fred, the Fred Lawson Observatory. Uh, we can now have up to 25 people on the site outdoors and five people with, with masks on in the observatory. And uh, so we just ask that you respect the uh, current uh, regulations around that. And I think uh, that number may be going up when we next Friday, when we move to the, uh, the next stage, but right now it's limited to uh, 25. Here are some of the folks that are involved in uh, running our club here. And uh, if you need to contact any of them, their names are, are here. We had 87 people out tonight. So thank you folks for coming out. Thank you to all the uh, speakers and a special thanks to our two main speakers, uh, Pierre and David, uh, excellent presentations. And uh, thank you to all the folks with their, with their observations. A special thanks to the RESC National Office for the use of their Zoom account for these meetings. If you have any ideas, comments, I'd be happy to hear them. Meeting chair at ottawa.resc.ca. I am looking for speakers for November and December this year. So uh, please uh, send those to me. By the way, Dave, every time I put this number on this slide saying it's the maximum of people at any one time, typically we have about 10 to 15 more than that in our total uh, participation in the meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So close to a hundred today. So that's yeah. super. Okay. Okay. If you're not a member of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, I encourage you to get a membership. Regular memberships are $88. Family memberships are $82.50 plus $15 per adult and $8.10 per youth. And youth membership uh, under 21 years or under 25 if you're a student is $53. So what you get for these memberships? Next slide, please. Uh, locally, we you have access to the uh, Fred Lawson Observatory, which is out uh, um, near the Mill of Kintail. We have the 10 Bean Telescope Loan Library. And once we get back into the museum, you'll have access to the our, uh, our library of books. And then from the national level, you'll get Sky News, which comes out every two months. And uh, the you'll also get the journal electronically. And that comes out every two months as well. At the start of every year, we have the Observer's Handbook. And every month, uh, Gordon Webster pulls together our astronauts, which is our award-winning uh, local newsletter for the Ottawa Centre. So thank you very much, folks, for coming out tonight. Uh, sorry, we were running about 15 minutes past the time I promised, uh, but uh, I hate to cut things off. So next meeting is August the 6th. And uh, we're just working on some details around the speakers for that, but we will be dealing with uh, astrophotography as our, as our main uh, topic for that meeting. And get your observations together, and we'll see you next month. Stay safe.